the, the glorious uh, ideals and ideas of the Declaration of Independence, which we celebrate as we should every Fourth of July, and as we know our our secular faith, yes. um, would have been nothing more than a declaration, words on paper, if it hadn't been for the people who were out doing the hard slogging and the fighting against all odds, suffering terribly. One of the reasons I wanted to write the book was a line that Abigail Adams wrote to her husband at about this time. She said, future generations who will reap the blessings will scarcely know the hardships and sufferings we've endured in their behalf. Hmm. And we don't. We don't sufficiently know. When I, I knew she wrote that, and when I read that, it reminded me that these people knew they were making history. Absolutely. Absolutely. They knew that they were, ca were being called upon to play a part in one of the great historical dramas of all time, and that they would be judged by how they played their parts, each individually. Henry Knox, wonderful young Henry Knox, one of the one of the most admirable people in the whole An story. An aide to George Washington. Aide to George Washington, com commander of artillery, a former Boston bookseller who didn't, knew nothing more about the military than what he'd read in books, 25 years old. And he writes the very day that the text of the Declaration of Independence arrives in New York from Washington, from uh, Philadelphia. He writes, as we play our parts, history will judge us ill or favorably. Uh, the future will judge us ill or favorably. So they, uh, they know that, that they are part of history. And I think that's an extremely important thing to understand. Great that you pointed out, because that gave them a kind of sense of responsibility, a, a, a duty. Mm. Uh, they didn't have, they didn't have much cause to have hope when you consider the odds against them. No real army, no navy, <clears throat> excuse me, no, no money, no gunpowder. Um, Washington never commanded an army in battle in his life before he was given the but role of commander But speaking of knowing his role in history, I mean, George Washington, who we get to know here, was carried forward because he understood what he had to do. Even though he didn't have a great strategy, even though he was, as you say, not a great general by any other definition except that he was a great leader. He was a leader. That's the, that's the key to Washington. He, he isn't an intellectual like John Adams or Jefferson. He isn't a great um, orator like Patrick Henry. He isn't a brilliant uh, Napoleonic sort of figure. He's a leader. People will follow him. And he has absolute integrity, and he will not give up. And he never forgets what it's, forgets what it's about, what the war is for. Mm -hmm. And again and again you have people saying that they're not going to quit because I will not leave this good man. You know, they're, they're, we have to remember that at one point, it was down to 3,000 troops. That's all he had left. Hundreds, thousands had either quit, gone home when their enlistments expired, deserted, went over to the enemy. Because they were given pardons. Absolutely. And people in New Jersey, when uh, Washington and the Army were retreating across New Jersey, when uh, the uh, General and Lord Howe, the, the British commanders, uh, offered uh, pardons for anybody who would sign the loyalty oath, People in New Jersey came by the thousands mm -hmm. to sign as quickly as they could. Uh, it, it, if there had been polls taken, daily, daily polls taken, and run in the newspapers, uh, it, would have, it would have just disintegrated immediately because people uh, would, would realize that this is, mm -hmm. we haven't got a chance, it's right. over. Just a couple of points here. You thought of this, this story, midway through the John Adams book. Yes, I did. What caused you to think about it? The letter from Abigail? or? No, it was when I was writing the um, chapter of dealing with the summer after the Declaration of Independence was signed. And the whole war effort is starting to fall apart. And then came the Battle of Brooklyn and the escape from Brooklyn, the miraculous night yeah. escape by Washington. And when you're writing biography, you can't stray from your uh, subject very much. Elizabeth Longford, who wrote the great uh, biography of, uh, of, of Queen Victoria, said, you can't, you can't leave your subject for more than f five pages. And she was right, you can't.
Yeah. And I wanted very much to write about, in some detail, about the Battle of Brooklyn and about the escape from Brooklyn. And I thought, well, you can't do it here, but you could do it in the next book. And um, so I begin with, which, some, which surprises some people, I begin with George III going before Parliament. That's how the book begins. Yes, in October of 1775, to declare that the American colonies are in rebellion <laughs> and that their leaders, this these uh, rabble rousers. He calls them the unhappy Americans? Or the unhappy Americans, absolutely. They're traitors. He says yeah. so. And that, that he, the king, and the British power of the British army and the British empire are going to bring these people to heel. They're going to crush the rebellion. And it's when that speech reaches Boston on the first day of the new year, because of the yeah. great delay in crossing the ocean, first day of 1776, that the people in the army under Washington, people everywhere, realize this isn't going to be a short, uh, unpleasant business which will wind up in recon with yeah. reconciliation, and that we better be fighting for independence. Now, they don't dare say it right away, although some of them are writing it, like Nathaniel Green is writing it in his letter. Another aide to George Washington. Yes, Nathaniel Green, who, like, like young Knox, knew no more of the military when he joined up. <laughs> and when he was made a general at the age of 33, knew no, no more of the military than what he'd read in books. But we have to remember that was an age that felt, if you wanted to learn how to do something or know something, a good way to do it was a close study of books, right. which is the whole idea of the Enlightenment. Yeah. Washington, Green, and Knox all had about the equivalent of what we would say a fifth, fifth grade education and as far as formal schooling. Everything I know about this is because of your book. These two guys are New Englanders, and George Washington is a very, very patrician Virginian. And he At ardently dislikes New Englanders. <laughs> he looks down on them. He thinks they're dirty and unruly. They have this unfortunate idea that they like to decide things for themselves, <laughs> which, of course, you can't have in an army. But he overcomes that bias, which is real a big inner struggle. He has to because that's all he's got is a New England army. Mm. He has some people from the middle colonies that join join. Them. Now he takes command at age forty three in seventy five. And ne never commanded an army in battle in, before in his life. Never. Um, and he said to Congress, I'm I'm not qualified for this job. I'm not I'm not the man. But he also knew that he was better than anybody else they could pick. And they choose him, not because he's a great general. They know he's fought with him in the French and Indian War and had a distinguished record. They pick him because they know him as a person, and they pick him because they know him as a politician. He is a political general, and that's sometimes used in a dismissive or a, um, less than complimentary way. Mm. We should, be, we should thank God that he was a political yeah. general because he never forgets who's boss, Congress's mm -hmm. boss. So we've got Washington at 43. Uh, he goes to the Constitutional Convention, though, in a uniform, yes, even though he's saying, I'm not the man. Yes, and, and he's what, certainly what, signaling that he's available. No, yeah, exactly. Uh, there's a contradiction him, there. If they choose him. Well, yes and no. I think he's, he's being perfectly honest in both. He will serve if called upon to serve. He is ready to serve. He has his uniform. He's reminding him that he is a military man at heart. Yeah. But he's very genuine. But look, I'm not the ideal fellow for this job. And he makes, he makes some very bad mistakes in judgment. He's, his, uh, he was outfoxed, outflanked, um, outnumbered, to be sure, made to look pretty inept at the Battle of Brooklyn. He was so indecisive at the time of the siege of Fort Washington that he really cost uh, that that bastion that they thought was impregnable, along with several thousand of his troops and hordes of supplies and cannon and the rest. These were terrible defeats, Charlie. These were very, very serious. And yet he did not quit. He did not succumb to his own sense of defeat and failure. And the people who followed him, with a, only a few exceptions, were determined to stay with him, as was Congress. It is said about him that he had this special quality and that you couldn't quite put your finger on it, but you knew 
from the people who saw him up close that he had it. Yes. It's almost like an X factor. Yes. He he com he was a commanding figure. Tall? Oh yes, six feet two, probably weighed 190, 200 pounds in perfectly perfect physical condition, the prime of his life. He was a young man, he was only 43, right. but they were all young men. Yeah. Now Green, 33, Knox, 25, Adams was 40, Jefferson was 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. We forget this. Yeah, we do. We see them, we Franklin them. was the only one who had the yes, age on him. and he was of a different generation. He was old enough to have been their father. Yeah. But we see them as the white-haired uh, founding fathers, uh, patriarchs. Mm -hmm elder statesmen, but at this point they're not. It's a young American's cause. And uh, and they, they were not in the majority, ever. The people who were for the revolution were never in the majority. They were maybe a third. Adams, no one knows what the proportions really mm. were. There were no but, polls or surveys taken. But at least as many people were against the war as were for it. And they knew what would probably happen to them, the leaders, Absolutely. If they lost, yeah. off with their heads. Yes. They would be all hung. Yes. At the crack of dawn. Yes. Let me talk about the war for a second. In 75, they go to Boston. Uh, they win some early victories, don't they, in 76? No. In, no victories? No, nothing? Well, in, in the sense that they drove... Didn't they surround they, them they in drove, Boston? They drove the British out, out of Boston. They right. made it impossible for the British to remain in Boston by this incredible feat of ingenuity right. and, uh, and doing the impossible, hauling the cannon from Ticonderoga. Now, did that give them confidence? Oh, absolutely. Probably gave them too much confidence. They well, felt pretty big. After all, they'd driven the British Empire yeah, exactly. into Boston. And this was the biggest army, and the biggest... And they outsmarted them. The biggest superpower in the world. Yes. And they had taken them on and driven them out of Boston. And they were, they were jubilant. They were victorious team, you know, and they marched off to New York to face them on the field of battle for the first time. And they suddenly have a name. They're called the Continental Army. Right. They have a flag to march under. They have their general. And they're going to be joined in New York by the people from New Jersey and New Yorkers and Pennsylvania and so forth. And it will become more than it was in Boston, truly a Continental Army. And what happens? They got sick in great numbers, uh, epidemic dysentery, smallpox. They didn't understand the rules of hygiene. They, um, Washington divided his army, leaving half in Manhattan and taking other half over to Brooklyn. Mistake. Mistake. It was a mistake to try to defend New York. New York was indefensible because mm -hmm. they had no sea power, they had no navy. Mm -hmm. British came into New York with a fleet of 400 ships. And if the British Navy had gone up the Hudson, it would have been over? Oh, yes, or if they, no, if, 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 yes, indeed, it could have been. When Washington fought the Battle of Brooklyn with about 9,000 of his troops over there, it was soundly defeated, 300 Americans or so killed, yeah. over 1,000 taken prisoner, including three generals. It was a rout, it was awful. Now, there were pockets of, yeah. of valorous, uh, performance on, on the part of some of our troops. And uh, the, the miracle is that they didn't lose more. But at that point, the army was, in effect, in the midst of a real trap, because all the British had to do was to bring their fleet up the East River. Remember, East River, not the Hudson. And they would seal them off. Right. But the wind was in the wrong direction. If the wind had been in the other direction on the night of, say, September of uh, August 28th, 29th, I think it would have all been over. Because Washington would, and the army, half of his army would have been trapped. No there. United States of America if that I happened. I don't think so. And, or Just because of the wind, history absolutely. was changed. But then, the next day, uh, after the, the defeat of the Battle of Long Island, that they decide they have to escape. Night of August 29th, and they organize a retreat at night back across the East River by rounding up every boat they could get their hands on, on the, on the East River, on the Hudson, New Jersey, everywhere they could get boats. Brought them all over, and they took that army off of Brooklyn uh, in the night. 9,000 men, 
cannon, equipment, horses, everything, without the loss of a single man. Now, a re an organized retreat in the face of an enemy of overpowering strength is the hardest thing in the military operations to bring off successfully. And the fact that this amateur army, really undisciplined troops, green troops, people who never marched with a rifle before, a musket yeah. before, um, that they pulled this off and it worked, was it, it, it was as miraculous as the wind being uh, in their favor. I mean, you got to realize what they're facing, the largest expeditionary force ever mounted. Who had just defeated them in a horrendous battle, a huge battle, mm -hmm. the biggest battle ever fought on the on North American continent at, up to that point. Mm -hmm. And and the, the people who saved the army were the Marblehead, Massachusetts Mariners under a tough little general named John Glover. So you have a combination of both fate or luck or circumstance, the hand of God, as many said, with the wind being exactly what they needed. But you also had the skill, the ability of those mariners to pull that off. The boats were going across so loaded down that the, the, the water was only inches below the gunnels. There were no running lights. Yeah. They have to be absolutely silent. The enemy's poised to, to could, if the enemy had any idea that they were trying yeah. to evacuate, they could have descended on the army and annihilated them, truly, right then. Then they get across, most of them, morning is coming, there's a, there's a, there are a lot of them that are still back on the Brooklyn side, and it's going to be light, and they, that'll be curtains for them. In comes a providential fog, fog yes. that covers all of Brooklyn. Oh, yeah. But it doesn't happen on the New York side. Now, if you were writing a novel, <laughs> and you you had that happen, and say, no. No, no, it's going too far. It is, no, it's, that's too much. It's not real. Too much of a perfect weather. Yes. Uh, at this time, as they're retreating, what was the mood of Washington? Oh, it was one of abject discouragement. He was exhausted. He hadn't slept for three nights or more. They all were exhausted. Um, and he, and I'm sure he realized that he played his hand wrong, that it, he misjudged the whole situation. He, he, he never covered what was called the Jamaica Pass. There's a, there's a pass through the, the rough right, ridge that right. runs along uh, Long Island. And they, they had nobody posted there to stop the British from. So the British sent 10,000 men on a nine mile march through the night up and around, and they just completely outflanked us. It was a perfect military maneuver, perfectly handled, perfectly performed by the British, just as they're landing on Long Island. Everything was done just right. Now, if General Howe had attacked after he had them on the run, and they were retreating back to the fortifications on what is now present-day Brooklyn Heights, it could have ended then. But so what does this say about the British and their leadership and their tenacity? Well, this is a big puzzle, and, and uh, historians and military uh, scholars have debated it for 229 years. Um, <clears throat> why didn't Howe move in for the kill? Some say he didn't do it because he had such a bloody experience at Bunker Hill, where the Americans were in position on a high ground, entrenched, yeah. and he wasn't going to attack right, them in right, a frontal right. way again. The, the, it had been awful. They'd lost a thousand men. But on the other hand, he would he would attack a frontal position later on at, at Fort Washington. I think he felt, why, why destroy them completely when we've got them and we're going to win this and let's let's pull back a little bit. Let's not just crush them because we want them back into yeah. the into the empire. Sort of, sort of, you know, they wanted to maintain the union yes. and and politically he was a Whig. Not end up like the South did, mean, like the South did after the Civil yes, War. That doesn't mean he uh, wasn't a, a very tough and very professional soldier. He was and very smart and very courageous. The two Howes were brothers. Two Howes were brothers, and it was one Richard was, and one, one, William. One and was William. The, Richard was the admiral, and William was the uh, the general. And they were very high, highly placed, very influential figures in London society. Uh, they uh, were aristocrats, as all officers were, and 
any picture we have of bumbling uh, aristocratic fools in high command uh, not. during our revolution is, is simply not so. And also, there are many misconceptions. Uh, okay, what about the misconceptions of George the Third? George the Third is seen as the crazy king who lost yeah. the colonies. And he is, in fact? He was a very intelligent man, very interesting man. I find him a very sympathetic character. He was a great collector of books. He was a, a wonderful painter. He was <clears throat> he was a uh, musician. He was a devoted father and and uh, and husband. Uh, he was intelligent. Uh, Samuel Johnson thought he was charming company, and Samuel Johnson did not uh, judge people lightly. But he saw as his duty to crush this rebellion. His mother had said, "George, be king." And when your mother tells you to be, <laughs> be king, king, you, you better be, be king. king. Yeah. And um, and uh, he was still fairly pretty young, and the and the madness of King George, which we know about from because of a play. play and the movie, that doesn't come for twenty years later. Yeah, it's, a, it's long after right. the, the fact. War. Okay, yeah. let me say this: this is this is history at the ground level. This is history on the battlefield. Yes, this is diaries from soldiers. Yes, that's the real story I wanted to tell. Yeah, and you like some of them. I like them a lot. Hodgkins. Uh, Joseph Hodgkins, great, great guy. Your favorite Ipswich, character. Ch Ipswich Shoemaker. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm very partial well, to Jabez Fitch, too, the okay. Connecticut Well, farmer. tell me about both of them. Hodgkins, Hodgkins first. Hodgkins uh, uh, was a shoemaker, had children and a wife at home, and Sarah, who, to whom he wrote regularly, no matter what was happening. And they're wonderful letters. And he talks about, if I'm told to march with this glorious cause, I will march. And he fights, and he fights on. After the escape from Brooklyn, in this terribly demoralized army, Hodgkins is writing to his wife. And he's just received a letter that the little boy, their, their youngest child, has died. He's known that the little boy was sick, and he was very worried about him. We forget sometimes these people are thinking about their families, they're thinking about their loved ones. And he, so they've been defeated. It looks like it's over. They're exhausted. They're filthy, dirty. They have no proper uniforms or anything. He hears that this child that he adores has died, and yet he picks himself up and he goes on and he will not stop. Uh, because they believed in their leader, they believed in their mission, they believed in. In, in the holy idea that they were creating a nation? Yes, I think so. Now, Joseph Hodgkins and Jabez Fitch never talk about the Declaration of Independence. It's interesting. Yeah. I, I never found life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness mentioned. How about equality? Yes, I think more it's our, our nation, our country, right. our country. We're going to decide this for ourselves. We're going to make the kind of society or the kind of way of life here that we want. We're not going to be dictated to. That's what always drives revolutions. Yes. But they're not fighting for, because they're, they're exploited and suppressed right, and right. poor. They had the highest standard. Americans had the highest standard of living, average Americans, of any place in the world. But they wanted to shape their own destiny. Yes, exactly. Okay, and and, they, and they, they were proud of who they were. And they wanted to show these Brits that they could fight as well as anyone. Given some experience, they're learning from experience. Washington, Green, Knox, Glover—they're all learning as they're going along. And that was one of the values that Washington had. He one could learn from his strength. experience. Exactly. So it, when he's defeated, he doesn't say, "Oh, woe is me, uh, uh, pity me." But what can I learn from this? Experience had been his teacher all through life. He was. His father died when he was quite young. He was on his own from about the age of age 16, yeah. as all these other people were too. But the uh, the Jabez Fitch story is different because he's keeping a diary, and he kept a diary no matter what was happening, including after he was c captured and taken prisoner and put one of the on one of those vile British prison ships in the harbor here in New York. And I think he must have hid hid this. You shouldn't picture a beautiful leather diary, you know, like, yeah. it, it, they're writing on little scraps of paper, and I think he yeah. was hiding them in his shoe, uh, because that was against the rules, you weren't right. supposed to do right. that. But 
the, the fact that they wrote the letters, the fact that they kept the diaries, is, is part of our, their great contribution to their country, because well, now we know what it was like. We can be in their shoes, in their skin, in their, and, and feel what they went through, these very human beings. And also, I think what comes across is how tough they were. These people were people who, who had been beat up by yeah. life, just by life in peacetime, by, by our standards. Yeah. We are sort of contained in cotton compared to how life was then. They did not know how it was going to turn out. Right. And they also knew that with, without courage, without an understanding that life isn't always a big gift of a bed of roses, you're not going to make it through life because life was hard. Any New Englander, for example, knew that it's best to expect the worst. You know, life on a New England farm, and most all of these people are farmers, was a struggle. Life was, it was a battle. And, um, you know, they, many of these fellows had no shoes. Mm. And, of course, in the wintertime, it was terrible. And, and, the, and the sort of legendary st stories of their leaving bloody foot footprints in the snow from marching in their bare feet, those are tr that's true, really happened. But you also have to understand that a, a farmer, particularly a f young farm boy, as many of them were, went barefoot all summer long from about late May to probably October. They had tough feet. They weren't like our feet. Um, and that, that's, that's something to understand. They knew how to fix a broken wagon. They mm. knew how to pull out a stump or dig a trench. They, they were used to hard work. Right. They, knew how to, they knew how to survive outside. Yes. Uh, let me take you back to the battle. So they, they retreat to New Jersey. Yes. Down to 3,000, 2,500 yep. men. Ill-clothed, ill-fed. Not enough cold. Cold. Yep. It is now December, November, December. It, things are precarious. George Washington, on Christmas night, decides what? Well, all hope was gone. He said himself, the game's pretty nearly up. Well, we sometimes when all hope's gone, the thing you do is attack. Freedom is having nothing else to lose. Yeah. So he, he's wanted to attack all along, in, from Boston on. He's constantly wanting to attack. And, and his councils of war again and again and again are pulling him back from that wisely. Had he launched an attack on the British in Boston, it would have been a catastrophe. For Overwhelming us, force. For us, absolutely. But he decides Christmas night they're going to attack, they're going to cross the Delaware and strike at Trenton where there are 1,500 Hessians, right. German mercenaries, um, bivouacked for the winter. They're sort of outposts, while the major part of the British Army, the enemy army, has pulled back, most of them back here to New York. And uh, they, they cross at night, and they march through the night. And to give you some idea of how rough that was, the only fatalities, the only men we lost in the Battle of Trenton were two guys that froze to death on the march. Wow. Uh, just froze to death. And they hit early the next morning, and it was a rout because it was a total surprise, and they came in determined to really win. And um, when it was over, Washington turned to one of his officers and said, this is a glorious day for America. And it was. He knew, he knew what the psychological impact of the victory was. What did be. it do? It gave people the idea that we might win. Even though it took six to seven long years. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, they didn't know that yet. Yeah. <laughs> that we could beat them. It was possible to fight them and beat them. Now, it wasn't a big battle. It wasn't like the Battle of Long Island, Battle of Brooklyn, as it was called then. It was a small battle. It was a fierce fight, bloody for, for the enemy, for the Hessians. And the Hessians were not drunk from Christmas celebrations the night before, as uh, many people have 
written and said. They weren't. Washington then had to do something, and the the natural decision would have been to retreat back across the Delaware, where he was pretty safe because the British didn't have any boats to get across. But he didn't do that. He turned and made a big loop around and came up and struck at Princeton and won again. Two victories, one right on top of the other. And that com that combination just changed morale of everybody. You can read it in the letters of Abigail Adams. You can read it in all kinds of people, all uh, ministers and, and attorneys and people in all walks of life writing about what it meant to get the word that we had won at Trenton. Mm -hmm. and, and while Princeton was important, and it was a victory, Trenton was far and away. One of the most important events in the war, and consequently one of the most important events in history. It, it, would, it would truly change the world. That little victory at Trenton. time attack 20... on Trenton, which was a little billy. And thing. he took 2,500 men over. Yes. And two other attacks were to be launched farther down the river. It was a three-pond and, and, and the this, other ones didn't. And in this case, Washington was the field commander. He rode with the troops, but he was not commanding them immediately. General Greene and General Sullivan were in command of the two prongs that attacked. And our old friend, the Boston bookseller, uh, Henry Knox, was in charge of the artillery, and the artillery really uh, were decisive in that battle. So these two guys that George Washington chose early, in 75 yes. served him brilliantly. And they served him through the entire war. They were the only general officers to stay the distance, to go the whole way and, with and Washington. Only two. Washington, Knox, and Green are the only ones that fight through the whole war, of the general officers. They all would come in and serve and be yeah, killed they, or leave. Yeah, so they leave. Now, Hamilton came in at some point, didn't he? Yes, he's... An, didn't he's, he serve as an aide to Washington? Uh, he does later. At yeah. this point, he's a art, young artillery officer, and he fought in the Battle of Trenton, and he fought, fought in the Battle of Princeton. And what did he and think he of... the Battle of New York. And what did he think of Washington? He idolized him. Later on, they would have their differences, and then they would patch that up, and, of course, he would become... Washington's Secretary of the Treasury. Yeah. Did did Washington have after after he is one of the great men in history? Yes. Helped there, but for George Washington, there is no America. That's my feeling. I think he's the greatest president we ever had. I think he's the greatest American of all. Because if it weren't for him, as you, you just said, there would be, in my view, be no United States of America. And he did it all right, particularly when he became president. He set the example, just as he was setting the example as, a, as the general, as the commander-in-chief, in the very dark days of the revolution. I think we've got to understand that how human they were, because that makes their achievement all the more remarkable. If they were gods, gods can do anything. And uh, they weren't. They weren't superhumans. They were extraordinary people, and some of them were truly brilliant. And it is truly a miracle what they accomplished. But these were the people that were present at the creation. The founding fathers. The present, present there. They were making a country, making a revolution first, and then making a country against the most daunting odds imaginable. Where did the phrase present at the creation first come? Because it was also the title, I it think, was, of Dean Acheson's book. It was book. used in, as the title of Dean Acheson's marvelous book about uh, the Truman years. Yeah. But this is the real creation. And, you know, they're not, they're not just starting a new company or a Broadway show or it's something. It's a nation. They're making a country, a nation. Right. And, um, and they don't know how it's going to come out. If they'd taken a poll in Philadelphia, in the country, in the 13 colonies in 1776, they never would have gone ahead with it. Only about a third of the people were for it. Odds were against them. Odds were against them, and it wasn't popular. Yeah. It was not popular. At the, least as many okay. people were against it, and the rest of them were waiting okay. to see so how it turned out. So what manner of man and woman was in favor of it? Well, to a large de degree, they were New Englanders and Virginians. New Yorkers and Pennsylvanians. Some from South Carolina, but yes. mainly New Oh, yes, definitely. We have to include the Carolinians, <laughs> absolutely. Yes, indeed. Uh, Don't and, you dare. And, and Maryland. But yeah. the central states, right. pr principally New York and Pennsylvania, were very much on the fence. They were 
Yeah. Led by a man named John Dickinson, a very okay, admirable Okay, but, but I'm asking, were, what was the nature of the revolutionist, is my question. Sort of, I mean, are the, were, they, were they intellectuals? Were they political mm -hmm. firebrands? Were they what? what? They were all that. They were intellectuals, firebrands, ambitious politicians, yeah. uh, decent, uh, uh, hardworking uh, people who uh, had farms, and uh, just were offended by the way things were. They were, they were, they felt that they were not being granted the rights that they that were their birthright as yeah. English subjects. In other words, they're not so much revolting to create a new and very different kind of society. They're saying, "Wait a minute! You're taking away our rights." as English subjects, free Englishmen, uh, a government of laws, not of men. And you're taxing us, with, n and we have no choice in that, and you're taxing us to pay your own bills back home. Why should we pick up the tab for your expenditures there in England when we have no part in that life? Most of us never seen England. And besides, it's probably time we started our own country. No taxation without representation. Right? Yes, and they, and they want it, they, 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 when they say free and independent, it, it, the concept is that they can't be free unless they're independent. And they can't generate the moral fire, the morale, let's say, the spirit to fight a war unless they're fighting for independence. All right. so, so they have to do it in order to give, give spirit to the army, and they're not going to be able to get any help from abroad, namely France if they don't declare their independence because France is not about to come in and give financial and military support to a country that's going to make up and go back and be part of England again. Their Fran the French support of our American Revolution, which was essential to our victory in the American Revolution, was primarily as a way for the French to get at the English. It w they weren't anxious for a government of all the people, you know, and all men were created equal. France yeah. was a monarchy. Uh, it was much more than a, more of a monarchy uh, than uh, even uh, than Great Britain was. Yeah. So um, it's amazing when you think about that. And when, on the great decision of the war against France, John Adams yes believes president. that the most important thing he did yes was to want peace with France and not yes. war. Most Americans don't realize that we were fighting a war with France in the last years of the 18th century. In the, during the John Adams administration as president. We were fighting an undeclared war at sea, but it was a real war. Yeah. Exchanging fire, uh, c capturing ships, uh, t all, all the acts of war at sea. But the real war, that the, the uh, undeclared war at sea could have very well uh, ignited into a real war with, as it happens, the new uh, high uh, 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 dictator, if you will, the emperor, uh, right. as he claimed, proclaimed himself, Napoleon. Uh, but Adams steered a very uh, careful, dangerous, treacherous even course among the shoals and the, and the, uh, and the whirlpools of diplomacy and managed to keep America neutral, not to side with either England or France. The Jeffersonians wanted peace with France at any price. The Hamiltonians, or the High Federalists, as they were called, were very eager to go to war with France. Mm -hmm. It was good politics. It, would have, it probably would have guaranteed Adams' re-election re had they gone to war with France. So when he ne succeeded in keeping us from going to war with France after the humiliations of the so-called XYZ affair, he felt that he had saved the country from a colossal blunder, and he was right. But it was at the expense of his own political fortunes. And he knew that that was. And going where to did happen. he place that effort in terms of his own historical legacy? Where did he place that? Yeah, he thought it was number one. That's what I thought. Yes, yeah. I think that uh, he was proudest of that of anything he'd done, and it really does. And other historians agree, it really does rank as an extremely brave, correct, politically courageous act, a true uh, profile in courage. There are many similarities between Truman and John Adams. Like there are very great differences. What are the similarities? Both farmers' sons. Right. Both uh, short uh, in stature, not uh, charismatic or handsome. Uh, both great readers of history. Both letter writers. Both very uh, direct. Both letter writers, exactly. Both very direct in their candor, and uh, and both underestimated, and and both men of character and integrity, and and both um, vice presidents who followed. Uh, looming 
uh, 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 idolized uh, presidents right. before right. them. Um, and that, but with, with having said all that, there were tremendous differences. Like? Uh, Adams was brilliant. Adams was a, an intellectual, a, a giant mind. Truman was very intelligent, but not that. Adams was learned, probably the most widely, deeply read of his American of his day, more so even than Jefferson, a farmer's son who became right. that. Right. Um, and Adams did not like party politics. He thought party politics were vile. He thought that, the country, as did Washington, that the country would be destroyed by party, party politics because people would begin to think more about the fortunes of their party than the fortunes of the United yeah. States of America. Imagine him thinking that. Yeah. I was going to say, one of the other similarities was they both had a great sense of, of the country and what it meant. Oh, absolutely. And the mission of and the country. And they were true patriots who, who showed that uh, by, by risking their lives, by going to war or by go, going to uh, serve overseas, as Adams did in the midst of war, crossing the Atlantic four times, a great risk to his life signing a declaration of independence that declared him as it did all the others, now, traitors. Were they, were they loners or, or not? Were, was Truman more of a kind of club guy and Adams was no, a loner? No, Truman was very much not a loner at all. Right, he was uh, a club guy. Yes, he was much more. He was very active in the Masons. Right, he exactly. was a very good party man. Uh, they're both devoted to their wives. Yeah. Uh, they were both... Abigail and Bess. Yes, uh, and they were both uh, well well advised by their wives uh, backstage, off, off Bess stage. was a wise counsel to Yes, I think she Truman. was. Bess abhorred public life. Uh, she, uh, she would freeze in front yeah. of a camera, became an old stone face. But uh, whereas Abigail loved public life, Abigail adored politics. And in many ways, Abigail Adams was a better political thinker uh, than it was her husband. She, okay. she had a wonderful capacity to judge him, people. I'm going to get to that book in a moment. Suppose I'd said to you, David, this is a really good idea, but this is going to take 10 years of your life. Yeah, I would have said no. Mm -hmm. You would have. Oh, absolutely. I'm glad I didn't know because I never would have done it. But did you, I didn't did, know how did you never thought about quitting? I never, no, never, never, never. No, I've been very lucky in my subjects, Charlie, and I've, the more you learn, the more you want to learn. And every book I have never known a great deal about any subject that I've embarked upon to write about, ever. So that's a voyage that's, of discovery for you. Yes, and if I knew all about it, I wouldn't want to write the book. It's it's a it's a it's a journey, and and you learn so much by doing this, and you learn a lot about yourself. Um, like what? Well, I, writing this may sound strange, but I think writing history requires a great deal of imagination. I don't mean that, that you're making things up. But you have to be able to transport yourself into that other time and into the shoes of those other people. Get inside their skins, if you will. Mm -hmm. And that takes imagination. That takes empathy and sympathy. I don't mean sympathetic in the sense of feeling sorry for them, but sympathetic in you understand what trouble they were in or how complicated mm -hmm. the situation may have been and what they didn't know. We have to always remember they don't know an awful lot because they're caught up in the moment just as we are and they don't yeah. know how you know, things are going to turn out. That's a but very, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but I, I, I also feel that for me it's been a, 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 a opportunity for self-expression because I can express things that I feel about human nature, about life, about the bonds of friendship, family, about loyalty about bravery under difficult circumstances and about our country that I'm dying to express, that I want to express. I can't understand how anyone who professes to love our country can have no interest in, in our history. Exactly. Well, let me go back to Jefferson, too. What's interesting about this is everything Adams was, Jefferson wasn't. Jefferson yes. burned all the letters that he and his wife wrote? Yes. Or received? Yes. Jefferson lives in a different world from Adams. He's been, he's been born and raised in a different world. His first memory was of being carried on a pillow by a slave. First thing yeah. he remembered in his life. 
He is, of course, our great uh, voice, our great uh, pen, as they said then, of the American idea. Is that ideal. what they call him? A great pen? The great, he was the pen of the revolution, right. the pen of, right. and Adams was the voice. Um, and, and he speaks for the equality and the, and the common man. And here he is living as far removed from the, the daily rounds life of the common man as one could get, served in every possible way by um, uh, people held in bondage by slaves. Adams, who is of the common man, Adams, who was a farmer's son, whose mother was almost certainly illiterate, yeah. who grew up knowing that life particularly in a New England farm, is a struggle. He's saying, you got to watch out for the common man. I know, I'm one of them. And the majority, if they get too much power, can be as despotic or as dangerous as an individual. So they're sort of the yin and the yang of the American Revolution. I've always been fascinated by the idea of first Adams, Jefferson, and Franklin. Of those three, is it automatic that Jefferson loved Paris more than the other two, or is it hard to tell? I don't think he necessarily did love Paris more than the Jefferson. other two. Yeah. Jefferson, I don't think. Adam spoke French better than he did, read it more readily than he did. Yeah. Uh, Franklin, of course, uh, took to the to the way of life right. immediately. <laughs> yes, uh, Jefferson was there longer. He was there five years. And I think in many ways they were as happy as any years in his life because he was away from slavery. Right. Although Sam, wasn't Hemings with him? Yes, but they were free while they were there. Yeah. And um, he... You really think he was so troubled by slavery that made him happy that he was away? Yes, I don't think he liked looking at it. I think he knew it was wrong, and I think he... Uh, and why didn't he give it up? Well, that's a very good question. We'll never know the answer. I have, to, I have a feeling it had to do with f finances. He was always he was always in debt, looking for and him. his greatest wealth was in his slaves, which yeah. was true of many Southern planters. He died very poor, didn't he, Jefferson? Died in broke, debt, and broke, and broke deeply yeah. in with, debt. with fine wine in his cellar. Yes, and he never stopped spending. Yes, exactly. I don't. He must have been a smooth talker when he went to the bank because uh, how he how he could get, get away with it all his life. Yeah, he was never not in debt. But I think that. Jefferson wanted to bring something home from Paris. He brought home paintings. He brought home some 80 crates of books and all kinds of things to raise the cultural level of the country. And I think that was a genuine mission. I know it was a genuine mission. And that's exactly what these people felt. These Americans were not disenchanted with their country. They weren't like the so-called lost generation. Right. They went to learn something and to bring something back. Yes, they weren't alienated from America. Yeah. And, and again and again, they would talk about, this is going to make me a better American, or I feel I'm a better American. Now, you're talking about the people at the time of Jefferson or the people at the time of the time 1870? Of the, uh, in 1830, 1900. Yes. And they're not going to bring home 80 crates full of stuff, yeah. but they're going to bring home themselves as a better sculptor, a better painter, a better physician, a better politician. Yeah. Excuse my curiosity about this, but because I've asked you about this before, when when the famous story that Jefferson and, and Adams died on the same day. Yes. Who was it that reached out to whom? Because someone told me, or, or you told me, that it wasn't either of the, that the person. I first heard that it was Adams' wife, Abigail, who was responsible. Then I heard no, that she actually. No, it was Benjamin Rush. Benjamin Rush. Benjamin Rush from Philadelphia, the physician, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Felt like what? He felt that they, th those two should have a reconciliation. Before they either both <clears throat> Before died. Before they died. And, and Adams agreed right away and wrote to Jefferson. And that's what started. So Adams wrote to Jefferson. Yes. Yeah. And Abigail had nothing to do with it either Nothing way. to do with it. In fact, Abigail was more angry at Jefferson. That's what I thought. That's what than, someone told me. That yeah. was a new information for me. Yeah. That, that Abigail didn't like Jefferson, was angry at Jefferson more than John. Yes. Well, she felt that he had betrayed her husband because he's the one that put the um, reporter after Adams uh, during the campaign uh, when they were about running against each other. On his orders, press. on Jefferson's orders. Yes, yeah. And so what does the that irony you? was that he was the same one who turned around and revealed the Sally Hemings uh, relationship on Jefferson because Jefferson, he felt, hadn't rewarded him sufficiently for the job he'd done uh, attacking Adams during the campaign.
Mm-hmm. But uh, but they were really they were true friends. They were as different as night and day, and and uh, they died on the same day. And they didn't die just on any day. They died on mm-hmm. the Fourth of July, yeah. their day. And Adams truly did say, Jefferson survives. Survives. It wasn't survives. still lives. Survives. No, survives. And Jefferson was dead. And Jefferson had died that morning. Wow. July 4th. Yep. Two. I had the opportunity to write to, about some of the most spectacular human beings I've ever... I don't mean that in that they were necessarily great, but they were interesting. I'm interested in the people. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not interested... An entirely virtuous person is not very interesting. Right. An entirely yeah, it's, it's perfect score. Goody, goody is, two shoes and all yes, that. Yes. No. No. You want the human. You want flaws so, and warts. I think writing history requires a great deal of imagination. I don't mean that that you're making things up, but you have to be able to transport yourself into that other time, and into the shoes of those other people. Get inside their skins, if you will, mm-hmm. and that takes imagination. That takes empathy. And sympathy. I don't mean sympathetic in the sense of feeling sorry for them, but sympathetic in you understand what trouble they were in or how complicated mm. the situation may have been and what they didn't know. Which of these stories, which of these characters, which of these books means the most to you? Can't answer it. It's like answering which your children. Um, I can say this. And no question about it. Of all the years, I've, 40 years I've been at work, the happiest, most fulfilling years, and I've loved every subject that I have undertaken. I've been very lucky in my subject. But the years I enjoyed most were the years writing the John Adams book because of that material. It was such a privilege to keep company with those people. They set such a high standard for us. You believe that you, if your subjects live to an older age, they lose some of their inhibition. They have a different perspective on things. They're freer yes. to talk with more I think so. I feel that way. Yeah. Somebody said, I don't know, maybe you know, that courage is having, been, courage is having done it before. Yeah. And... Um, um, I feel now that I see a lot more clearly than I did before. To write well is to think clearly. And that's why it's so hard. But it's also why it's so enjoyable. Writing is hard work, but I did, never equated ease with happiness. I'm often happier when I'm working than I am doing anything else. I'm on vacation every day. Every that's, day. Be, that's because you found something you love. I love it. And I want, it, I want you to know what I love. Yeah, me too. I do. And I want you to know much more about our country. And I want, I want people to understand that we too are being judged by history. History isn't just something that happened before we came on the scene. We're part of history. And how are we going to measure up? How will our political discourse, our participation as citizens, how will we look when they take a look at us 50 or 100 years from now? You've been part of our history, and I thank you for sharing it with me. Thank you, Charlie, very much, as always. (laughs) 